What's up guys, Mason the Brock Anderson here, and this is Legends of Tomorrow Season 3, Episode 9, Bebo the God of War. Um, if that title does not make you just burst into laughter from its, just, hilarity, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, this show is hysterical. I mean, my goodness, it, it's, <laughs> oh my lord, I mean, just the concept of it. You've got this little doll, Bebo, that gets transported back with young Martin Stein to ancient times. They're on old, like, North America before, like, Columbus came over. It's when the Vikings are coming over. They find Bebo and instantly make him their god. And so, yeah, Bebo is now the god of North America because the Vikings took over and worshipped Bebo. I mean, that is hysterical. Just the concept of that is hilarious. And it totally works. For a show like this, this concept is perfect. And they, they use it in all the right ways. You know, just all he says is Bebo hungry. And then uh, Leif Erikson's sister is just like, hungry for battle. <laughs> she just uses that to sort of inspire everybody to go fight for this little doll. Oh, it's so, so funny. So, yeah, I mean, the concept alone is hysterical enough. But they also, they do have their emotional moments. Um, so we'll go through piece by piece and talk about the, the different concepts. Uh, first, talk about Jax, because obviously this is kind of the big talking point for most of this episode. Uh, Jax apparently can't, just can't be a part of the team right now, because uh, of what happened with Martin last uh, last episode in the crossover. You know, Martin, they lost him, and so everybody's dealing with that, and it's just, you know, it does make sense. It wouldn't be easy for everybody to sort of rebound from that. Uh, I will say... The scene that they start off with didn't... It fit the tone of the show a lot, but I still felt like even for this show, it was just a little too goofy. Because you've got Leo, you know, the new Leonard Snart. You've got him, and he brings up a Martin Stein puppet and is using that to talk to everybody. I'm just like, you know, like, common sense would say this is just... This is not... I mean, it's not really that funny either. That's the thing. Like, it's not good, but it's not that funny. And I, I don't know how to really describe it. It just didn't really work for me. I'm just like, how would this work in a real life situation? You know, not that this is real life or anything, but in what way would this be a good idea? It, at best, people are able to maybe talk to the puppet and get out some of their frustrations. At worst, people look at the puppet and are like, seriously? I just lost my friend and now you're going to show me him in puppet form and try to that's kind of sick when you think about it. I don't know, it was just a joke that didn't really pan out like I think they were hoping it would. Especially because it's Leonard Snart doing it, it really didn't work. But I'll talk about him a bit more in a second. Um, but yeah, so Jax is dealing with the death, obviously, a lot more than the rest of the team. Because he was closer with Martin, and you know he had a psychic connection for him, uh, with him for a while. So obviously it's going to hit him harder. Uh, but yeah, so we see he's dealing with it for most of the episode. Um, they obviously, like I said, young Marty is involved. So he gets involved with that as well. He realizes that he dies in the future, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with changing the timeline. But Jax wants to try to find that loophole, you know, that doesn't change any time, just changes that one moment where now Martin doesn't die and he does get to go live with his family. But of course, young Martin is like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to risk messing up the timeline to do that. So, you know, it, it does make sense <laughs> as far as he's concerned. It makes sense that he wouldn't want to do anything like that because that's who Martin Stein was. So I like the fact that they did keep that very genuine, in my opinion. You know, they could have had young Martin be like, okay, yeah, I'll read it. And then all of a sudden we see, oh, yeah, now old Martin gets to live with his family and he's happily ever after. But no, that is not... That wouldn't be in fitting with Martin's character. And I think that's what they did very well here is that they kept true to who Martin Stein was in the end. You know, he would not want to change the timeline even if it meant he gets to live and see his family. So I'm really, really glad that they did that and uh, didn't have young Martin decide, oh yeah, I'll read it later down the line. Uh, he burned the letter almost instantly. So that was really good. But ultimately, Jax realizes that emotionally he can't really handle this right now. And so he does decide he's going to leave the team. Um... I, I find that very interesting on a couple accounts. I mean, for one, I'm not really sure. I mean, he doesn't have his Firestorm powers anymore, I don't think. Um, I'm not sure if the Firestorm cure it was supposed to trans, trans, transmute? Or 
a tribute. I, I don't know the scientific word for it, but I'm not sure if it was supposed to give him all the Firestorm powers or if it was just supposed to break their connection. So that way they're not psychically linked anymore and they don't have to, you know, merge to survive. Um, I'm not really sure exactly in the end what it was for, but I didn't see him use his Firestorm powers after, you know, he took the, the cure. So I'm assuming he probably doesn't have his powers anymore. But at the same time, he's the only one that really knew how Gideon and the ship worked. You know, he's the one that knew the Wave Rider. He's the mechanic. So... Yeah, it is kind of a question of now who's going to take care of the Wave Rider if something gets broken. You know, who's going to fix it? Because there's not another mechanic on there. You know, Ray, obviously, he's very good with technology and stuff, but he's not a mechanic. Now, I did see something on Twitter, and I probably just like a rumor article or something like that. Um, but I did see like an article saying, is Wally West going to go to the Legends? Because Wally is a mechanic, so it does sort of make sense whenever you think about it. And I didn't realize at the time why they were saying it. Now it sort of makes sense. Oh, you lost one guy who's a mechanic and also, you know, your racial diversity on the team. You lost one black guy. Let's bring another one on. But I don't know if that's why they're thinking that or if it's just the mechanic part, but whatever. It's just an article that I saw. Uh, but yeah, you know, that, that would be very interesting to see. You know, first of all, now you've got a speedster on the Legends. And Wally kind of has lost his purpose on the Flash. You know, he left for a few episodes and then came back. And so, yeah, he's kind of not really being used very effectively on the Flash right now. So it would be interesting to see if he went to the Legends, how they would be able to use him, you know, effectively as well. So, yeah, I'm pretty interested to see how Jack's leaving the team is going to affect them overall. Will they lose the ability to, you know, if the Wave Rider gets damaged, will they lose the ability to fix it? You know, what's going to happen? I don't know. But I'm really looking forward to seeing how they're going to sort of use this in the future. So then we get on to sort of the main meat of this episode. Uh, we see, you know, like I said, <laughs> Bebo is treated like a god by the Vikings. And so they decide to stay and conquer America in the name of Bebo <laughs> and it starts off really funny, but ultimately they manage to destroy the doll. Uh, Mick burns it with fire. And so they're just like, oh, well, I guess it was a false god. But then all of a sudden they realize, oh, wait, now it's Odin? Like, wait, what? And then all of a sudden Damien Dark shows up and pretends to be Odin and tells them that they're going to conquer North America. So, yeah, the Dark, uh, Damien Dark and his daughter, uh, Nora, they're both there. And they're both, you know, just controlling the Vikings and trying to mess up time and we actually come to find out from Agent Sharp, who came to help the team, which I'm I'm interested to see how her character is going to be used, but at the same time, I already see how they're sort of going with her, because there's a moment where she and Sarah are both drinking with these two guys, you know, two Vikings, and just like, you know, oh, where are your, where are your mates? We will kill them for you. And then Sharp's like, oh, I'm not really the husband type, and Sarah, like, gives her, like, a, ooh, look. I'm just like, really? Like, <laughs> do you have to do this? You know, I realize that the liberal agenda is heavy in media nowadays, but do you have to do this with two characters that could just be badass on their own without turning them into, oh, we gotta have some hot lesbian characters? Like, I don't... It feels like almost every show nowadays has to have some sort of homosexual relationship on it. I'm just like, you don't have to do that. I've seen shows survive without doing that. So, I don't know, it just, it feels kind of forced that all of a sudden, you know, Agent Sharp's like, oh yeah, I'm not the husband type, just out of nowhere. Um... But whatever the case, I, I am interested to see if she's going to be able to work with the team now. Because we already saw her start to respect them a bit more after what Sarah did with Rip, you know, telling her about Rip and what he was doing. We saw that respect start to show up a little bit more. Um, but in this episode especially, we see that she realizes that the legends can be useful in certain situations. And so she does sort of help them with the whole Bebo thing. Uh, but whenever Dark shows up with Odin... His, his whole Odin get up, she actually asked the Bureau for help, you know, to stop them. But the Bureau apparently has been really in disarray since Rip got put in prison for what happened with the whole Malice thing. Um, and we come to find out, you know, he's apparently gotten a lot of allies. You know, one of those we saw was Gorilla Grodd. And then we see a picture of Grodd, like, tearing down the Great Wall of China in some ancient photos. So, yeah, we're starting to see Dark's power has really grown beyond just his own power. Now he's actually got a team that he's putting together for Malice to destroy the timeline. And it's to the point where the Bureau, the Time Bureau, doesn't even feel like they can stop him, and they just, they don't want to help anymore. And so Sharp's just like, you know, sorry, but we can't. Um, but you can tell she actually really is very sorry. Like, she wants to help. She wants to stop him, but she knows they don't have the ability right now. But 
that is where the legends come in. So ultimately we get to the scene where Sarah's, you know, talking about her plan. Um, it was actually pretty funny the way they set it up because she's like, don't worry, I've got a plan. And then it shows her like getting captured, taken in, and then she kicks the guards out of the way, goes to shoot dark. He's like, hmm, hysterical, and then snaps her neck. And I'm just like, what the? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> Nate's just like, stop, wait, that's a terrible plan. I'm like, okay, don't do that. <laughs> like, for a second there, you got me. You got me. Um, but I just, I don't know why, but I imagined her telling the story because <laughs> the way it looked, you know, if she was telling the story, I just imagine her going, all right, so I break in there. I'm going to kick the guards out of the way, steal one of their weapons, go to shoot him, and then he's going to use his powers and snap my neck. And then he's just like, wait, wait, stop. That's a terrible plan. Um, I don't know if that's actually what's going on, but it's just the visual of it was hysterical. Uh, but yeah, then they go through the whole like, you know, oh, what if we try this? And, you know, they go through another plan and then they're they're trying to figure out like the, the intricacies of it and stuff. Um, and then ultimately we see it play out similar to how they were saying, but not quite. Uh, but, you know, we see you know, a few different things going on. Uh, Dark manages to sort of stop what they thought they were going to do. You know, Sarah stepping in, shooting an arrow right into his neck. He, like, grabs it and stops the arrow. But we see outside, uh, Mick and Leo are shooting their fire and ice at Nora until ultimately the they combine in the middle. And we've seen before what it can do on Flash. It, you know, huge explosion right on Nora. And as soon as it happens, you see Dark's, ex like, his whole expression just goes completely grim. And he's like, Nora. And then throws everybody out of the way, goes outside with his own spear, and then shocks the ground, you know, knocks everybody down, picks her up, and she's, she doesn't look like she's alive. I don't know if she's just knocked unconscious or if she actually is dead, but you can see he's truly concerned. He's about to get them out of there, but then Sarah manages to touch him right before they leave. She gets teleported to some alternate dimension. And ultimately, she sees Malice, uh, and he starts talking to her and tells her that everything is going to die. Everybody's going to experience pain. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see that we're finally getting into the whole Malice storyline. We finally have one of the team members see Malice for the first time. Um, I still don't know exactly what Malice is to begin with. You know, like, obviously, Malice is just too on the nose <laughs> as far as, like, what is Malice? Oh, he is Malice. Well, duh. Um... But I, I do kind of wonder, like, what exactly is he? You know, what in, in the realm of this show, what would they consider Malice? Is he, like, a god? Is he a demon? You know, we see Constantine at the end pop up and say that some sort of demon has been possessing a little girl and knows Sarah's name. So does that mean, you know, we're going to get into sort of Constantine's whole, like, power, like, magic stuff? I am excited to see him on the show because his pop-up on uh, Arrow is really interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to see if he's going to stay on the team maybe for a little bit just while they're dealing with this ultra-powerful demon. You know, his magic may be able to help them a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty excited to see what he's got, what he's going to bring, if anything. I hope he's not just like, oh, we're here for a few seconds on the next episode. See ya! And <laughs> just gone. Uh, but yeah, you know, this whole Malice storyline really has my interest. I mean, he seems like he's going to be probably the worst enemy that the team has faced so far. And that's saying something, you know, because Vandal Savage was pretty powerful, and then you got the Legion of Doom formed last season, and that was really interesting, you know. You got Eobard Thawne and Damian Dark and Evil Leonard Snart and uh, Malcolm Merlin? Yeah. So, you know, you got this pretty bad, badass team uh, lined up, and now you've got this just ultra-powerful demon that seems like he is unstoppable, even to the Time Bureau. That's a pretty interesting villain to go up against. So I'm really interested to see where it's going. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it for the main storyline in this episode. The last thing I do want to talk about, though, is, like I said before, I, I do want to mention Leo. Because in this episode, I'm still, I'm still trying to get used to Leo, to be honest. Because like I said in the crossover event, whenever they brought him back, I was excited, but at the same time, I was kind of... A little nervous on what they were going to do because first of all you know you've made him gay which it just feels like you're trying to do your whole liberal agenda again um but beyond that it just didn't feel like the same character to me you know it felt like first of all he's a goody two shoes he's not a criminal on earth x he's actually a good guy and so it was mick and he thinks mick oh yeah the mick on my earth he was a he was a good guy he was fighting cops and 
you know, I, I see some of the the funny moments that we can have between these two because, you know, before it was Mick who's a criminal and then Leonard Snart who is a criminal with a heart of gold who wants to help people but still is very selfish and wants to have, you know, complete his own needs. This Leonard Snart is very much a good guy and McRory is still McRory. So I can see where putting these two together could have some funny moments, you know, could have, like in this one we see Mick wants a beer but Leonard or Leo it's just like, oh, I've turned it all into swamp water. You know, I've had Gideon stop synthesizing beer and, you know, trying to get him to stop drinking so much. There were some funny moments there. You know, seeing Mick freak out and try to get beer wherever he could find it, it was kind of funny. But at the same time, it still feels so much different. And I guess different is kind of good. You know, it can be good if it's utilized effectively. But I'm still going to look at it and be like, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right for Leonard Snart to be all, oh, you shouldn't be drinking, Mickey. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this, Mickey. It just didn't feel right for most of the episode. But I will say they redeem, redeem themselves at the end. Uh, because there's kind of a little bit of a blow-up session between the two. You know, Mick is freaking out because he wants his beer and Leonard... I gotta stop that. Leo <laughs> walks in and he's just like, you know, oh, you're looking for your beer? Oh, the Mick I knew, he was a good guy. He did this and he did that. You know, comparing Mick to Mickey. And Mick, of course, doesn't really care. He just wants beer. And so they really blow up at each other. But ultimately at the end, whenever they're saying goodbye to Jax and they're having a little Christmas party, um, Mick goes to drink the beer and he's like, this is really good. And Leo tells him, you know, I had Gideon put it back. I shouldn't have tried to change you and I apologize for that. And Mick, like, you know, I appreciate you. You know, knock, knock, the, knock the glasses together. So I feel like they had this one episode where they're clashing. You know, they're not really getting along because they're two opposite sides of the coin. But by the end of it, I think they've sort of reconciled. And Leo realizes he shouldn't try to change Mick. Mick realizes that this isn't the Leonard Snart he knew, but can still be a good partner. You know, they can still work together very well. So I feel like they they took this one episode to sort of get all of those moments out of the bickering and the, the squabbling because, you know, this Leo is actually a good guy. And I hope that's it. You know, I hope this is the one episode where, okay, they do all of that and now we're done. You know, now they're just a team. Yes, Leo is a good guy now instead of being a criminal with a heart of gold, but they can still be a good team. And you know, we can still have some funny moments where Mick goes to try to burn somebody and Leo like, steps in the way and knocks his gun down. Like, Come on, he's just an innocent bystander, something like that. But they can still work together very effectively and still take on bad guys you know, like Nora and manage to stop somebody as powerful as that because they work well together. So I I'm hoping they're going to utilize that effectively. Um, but as far as mid-season pr uh, finale goes, I mean, it was a very good one. It definitely got my interest up for next half of the season. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more about Malice. I'm interested to see how the team is going to get on without Jax. You know, are they going to add another member to the team? You know, is Wally coming? Obviously, it's just a rumor right now, but he would be a good replacement, you know, with his mechanic, you know, abilities. He would be a good replacement for Jax as far as he'd be able to take over repairing the wave rider when needed. Uh, is Constantine going to feature throughout most of the next half of the season, or is he just going to be a slight cameo in the next episode? Um, all these questions and you know the Time Bureau obviously is still in existence, but not as effective anymore. Are the Legends going to be you know, kind of stepping in and helping out the Time Bureau, or are the Time Bureau just going to sort of fall apart because Rip is no longer in charge? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next half of the season. Hopefully you guys are too. So let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. What were your thoughts on this episode? Let me know what we can talk about and discuss all the good stuff. Leave a like and subscribe to Future Legends of Tomorrow, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.